Well, hello again. Welcome and thank you for joining us today. I'm Bob Continetti, Senior Associate Vice Chancellor for Academic Affairs, and I'm back to be your moderator for today's faculty town hall. Once again, we have a group of panelists to provide some updates on our continuing operations during the COVID-19 pandemic and to answer your questions. Some questions were submitted during registration. In addition, please feel free to use the Q&A window to submit additional questions for our panelists. Due to our time limitations, we'll not be able to get to all your questions today, but we will log the questions as they come in and post the answers on the Return to Learn website, which is uh, now in the uh, chat. Today's webinar has live closed captioning available in two ways. First, you can click on the closed caption button at the bottom of the screen and select show subtitles, or you can also click on the link that is now pasted into the chat. One reminder before we get started for everyone here today, uh, due to the significant security incident involving UC employee information that resulted from the recent Excellian data breach, we encourage everyone to enroll in the free identity monitoring service that's offered by the UC Office of the President. So please visit uh, cybersecurity.ucsd.edu for more details. And you can see uh, that uh, link is pasted into the chat as well. So with no further ado, I'd like to introduce uh, Chancellor Pradeep Kozla for some welcoming remarks. Chancellor Kozla. Thank you, Bob. Uh, good afternoon and welcome everybody. Uh, we have a lot of, uh, I think, good news to share. Uh, let me start with UC San Diego Health, which has UC Health in general has vaccinated, vaccinated more than a million people. And UC San Diego Health has vaccinated more than half a million, of which about 115,000 have been here at REMAC. Uh, so we have basically delivered more vaccines than any other UC. Uh, more than 20,000 faculty and staff are now vaccinated. And early this month, we, off, we started offering vaccines to our students. Positive case rates in the county had a slight uptick over the past few weeks, but they have stabilized. Uh, and the positive case rate on campus remains extremely low. Our expert modelers, our faculty and expert modelers have added new data to our campus model and the news seems very good. And you're gonna hear more about this uh, later today uh, in this webinar. And all of these factors have encouraged us, enabled us to relax some of our campus COVID-19 safety protocols. Our fully vaccinated individuals working on campus are no longer required to test weekly. So if you are vaccinated fully, which means two, two doses and two weeks beyond the second dose, then you don't need to, have, uh, then you don't need to uh, test on a weekly basis. Faculty and staff may also host in-person business meetings of up to 10 people indoors. So you can be in your office holding business meetings or in your conference room. Students are also permitted to gather outdoors in groups of 10 or less, and opportunities for larger outdoor events are also available. So as you can see, we are slowly but steadily opening up our campus. Commencement ceremonies will have a limited in-person outdoor experience option, and graduates, graduates, of course, will also always have the option of uh, being virtual if that's what they want. So we are also continuing the thoughtful process of increasing the number of researchers and faculty on campus HR continues to collect survey and idea web data. And between now and June 1, staff will continue in their current work arrangements, which is primarily remote. Between June 1 and September 1, we will bring, your, we will bring the support staff back to campus. And our return to campus plan is being implemented based upon three guiding principles. Number one, timing will be driven by operational needs, which differ across units. Some employees may return to campus sooner than September 1 based on your VC decision. Number two, operating models for the fall quarter will reflect the lessons learned during the pandemic. There may be new ways to best deliver the services uh, that we deliver. And number three, managers will do their best to provide 30 days advance notice so that you can anticipate and plan for your staff to return. One of the goals is to offer opportunities for greater flexibility for our faculty and our staff. And this includes those who've been working in person, in hybrid arrangements, and also in fully remote arrangements. All decisions will continue to be guided by a commitment to health, safety, and equity. And in the meantime, I encourage you all to get vaccinated. There is ample vaccine supply uh, than there is demand. There's more supply than demand right now on our campus. So the health and safety of our campus and our community depend upon it, and you, will, and you are a part of it. So please keep in mind, 
even once you're fully vaccinated, we need to continue to follow campus safety protocols. Wear a mask, keep your distance, wash your hands, and we will announce uh, more uh, protocols as we open up our campus slowly. So let me just say thank you very much for everything you've done. I think we've been in this pandemic for more than a year now. Uh, we've done extremely well, and all of it is thanks to all of you and to our students. So let me just hand this back over to Bob. Thank you for those uh, reviewing those promising developments, Chancellor Kozla. Now I would like to uh, welcome the host of today's town hall, UC San Diego Executive Vice Chancellor Elizabeth Simmons. UBC Simmons. Thanks very much, SADC Continetti. And uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, as you've been hearing, our, our campus is continuing to operate very smoothly, thanks to enormous efforts by the faculty and the staff and to great cooperation and um, uh, just consideration shown by the students. I'm actually co-teaching a remote seminar this spring, uh, a senior seminar, and I've been very deeply impressed by the quality of the student engagement and their intellectual contributions uh, to the subject matter, even during this, this challenging time. And it's our willingness to all work together that's made such a difference. So thank you very much. As the chancellor mentioned, as our vaccination rates climb and cases fall in San Diego County, we can look forward to an ability to have greater participation in research activities on campus, to keep using offices for academic work, to keep holding small indoor business meetings, and then to start transitioning during the summer in a thoughtful way to having more staff gradually start working on site as well. And this will set us up very naturally for a fall quarter conducted in a far more typical in-person mode research, classes, support services, administrative work, student activities. We will, of course, handle compassionately the special cases of international students who are unable to reach us for the start of fall due to visa issues or travel restrictions. And indeed, as you'll hear uh, in the program, we, we are already planning ahead for these anticipated needs, building off of what we learned last year. And we will remain vigilant in our masking, in our wastewater monitoring and so forth in the fall as CDC and state and local guidelines um, uh, recommend and, and, uh, and guide our thinking. But it's gonna be wonderful to see all of you back here on campus in the fall. Um, so that's something that I, I'm very much looking forward to. Now, ordinarily, I would turn the mic over to my distinguished colleague, uh, the Senate Chair, Steve Constable, at this point in the program, but today he's going to be addressing you a little bit later in the program. So instead, I'm going to return the mic to Dr. Continetti. Thank you, EBC Simmons. So I'd like to move on and uh, now uh, introduce our first presenters for today, Dr. Chip Schooley, Professor of Medicine, and Dr. Natasha Martin, Associate Professor of Medicine. They are uh, going to update us on the current status of the pandemic, important vaccine information, and the modeling for our projected fall activities. Thanks very much, Bob, and hello, everybody. Uh, it's nice to be back with you today. Uh, Dr. Martin and I are just going to make a couple of comments and then uh, look forward to opening uh, to questions uh, from you later in the session. From the standpoint of the vaccine update, as most people know, we are now using three vaccines in the United States. Two of them are vaccines uh, that use uh, messenger RNA technology, uh, and they've accounted for about 200 million doses uh, so far given. Uh, there is a recently approved viral vector vaccine made by Johnson & Johnson uh, that accounts for about 6 million doses given. So by far the vast majority of the vaccine given in the U.S. so far, and indeed by us at UC San Diego, has been messenger RNA-based vaccines. These have worked very well. They've produced incredibly um, good um, protection against all the variants that are circulating in the US and indeed the variants that have been circulating in other parts of the world. The Johnson & Johnson vaccine uh, is one that has had some recent, could I have, uh, some recent um, uh, discussion uh, at the uh, CDC and elsewhere uh, on the basis of a rare complication that has been noted uh, predominantly in women, uh, but not exclusively so, uh, that uh, is associated with uh, blood clotting, atypical blood clotting, often involving uh, an area in the brain called the cavernous sinus, but not always involving the brain. It's also been seen occasionally in the abdomen uh, and in the limbs. But this unusual form of clotting is caused um, 
usually in people who have a, um, a pre-existing antibody to a platelet factor four, most of the people who have the, this factor don't uh, get the complication, but some do. And it's been uh, of concern uh, that this has occurred in people who received this vaccine two to three weeks after it occurs. As you can see in this slide, uh, it's been seen in about 15 women out of uh, six and a half million people. Uh, recently, a man was uh, found to have had this happen at UCSF in Europe. A similar vaccine uh, also uh, causes this type of an abnormality that um, occurs about two to one in women to men. Uh, it's not been seen with the Pfizer vaccine and there are about three cases out of 83 million cases uh, in the Moderna vaccine. Uh, this led the CDC uh, to hold a meeting last week to decide what to do about the vaccine. Uh, the uh, CDC's uh, external advisory committee recommended that the vaccination uh, with this vaccine could resume uh, if people were appropriately informed, reasoning that the uh, complications from this vaccine um, are rare enough uh, that the number of people who would, who would have this morbidity uh, are much, much lower than the number of people who uh, would have morbidity if the vaccine weren't available. UC San Diego uh, still has this vaccine available. It's available only to those who opt in, those who ask for it after they've been uh, given the um, uh, information about this disorder. Uh, most of our vaccination uh, will continue to be with messenger RNA vaccine. Uh, to give you a sense of where we are in the US, uh, you can see that we're uh, nearing 40 to 50% of the uh, overall population in the US has received at least one dose of vaccine. Next slide. And as you might imagine, it's tiered so that older people are more likely to have received uh, uh, the vaccine uh, than younger people because the vaccine rollout had initially focused on older people. But starting about two weeks ago, uh, those uh, as low as the age 16 uh, have, have been allowed to uh, register vaccination uh, and for vaccination. And this has been rapidly increasing. We anticipate uh, by uh, midsummer. Uh, this will look like a much flatter uh, sort of a uh, histogram. Next slide. Now, as you heard from Chancellor Koshla, the uh, UC San Diego Health has been doing a stellar job of making vaccines available to those of us on the campus uh, and including our faculty, staff, and students. And we're uh, across uh, most of our um, uh, job categories uh, doing very well uh, in terms of vaccine uh, uh, access uh, and vaccine uptake. You can see here that uh, at this compilation, about 60% overall of campus employees uh, had uh, reached, um, had been vaccinated. And next slide. Uh, I'm sorry, I, I uh, missed the slide with the students. Students are about the same at the same um, uh, penetration. The main point here is that by next fall, we anticipate that um, uh, we will be very close to 100% of students being vaccinated uh, and uh, well above 80% or so of our uh, faculty and staff. Let me now turn this over to my colleague, Dr. Martin, who will tell you a little bit about some of the modeling that she's uh, and her colleagues have been doing, trying to get an idea about what this vaccination penetration means for what next fall will look like. Dr. Martin. Thanks, Dr. Schooley. So um, as, as he mentioned, one of the things we are trying to do and continually doing is iteratively adapting the simulation modeling and models that we've developed to inform our campus COVID response. And one of the key questions is how these high levels of vaccinations that we anticipate in the fall um, will affect uh, infection transmission on campus as well as um, our operations. So we have taken these models that we built last year and we are refining them and adapting them. And the goal was to inform contingency planning for the fall using plausible worst case scenarios. So selecting what we thought were reasonably conservative assumptions, um, what can we anticipate in terms of uh, cases and transmission on campus in the fall? So the model that we used was a model that we developed last year. It was published in Clinical Infectious Diseases and led by a new assistant professor, Ravi Goyal. And the model simulates SARS-CoV-2 transmission between on-campus students, off-campus students, faculty, and staff. So we incorporate all the UC San Diego community into this model. And as you can see on the right-hand side of this slide, we simulate the potential networks, uh, contact networks that individual, individuals have, for example, on-campus 
as students having residential networks, um, of roommates in their suite, uh, contacts within individuals in their building. But then those students also go to classes. And if we have in-person instruction, then of course um, they come into contact with other on-campus and off-campus students, as well as faculty in those classrooms. We also simulate the campus, random campus interactions. And we, we use these data to try to understand the relative impact of different um, policies and strategies on campus. So one of the key things that we've done to improve this model is to calibrate it to all the data that we've acquired over the course of this year. In particular, um, we have calibrated uh, this most recent round of simulations to data we obtained in the winter quarter in terms of the number of cases across our different groups, as well as likely transmission routes, where we can see that the vast majority of the cases that we saw on among our students, as well as our faculty, were likely acquired off campus. And of course, we had no campus related um, sorry, no uh, classroom related transmission or research related transmission that we know of. So we calibrate to that data that we have, and we use the model to look at the impact in the fall of increasing density on campus of doubles housing in person instruction, as well as in um, uh, examining the impact of vaccination. And here we uh, conservatively assume that vac the being vaccinated reduces an individual's risk of acquiring and transmitting infection by 80%. So there's still um, a simulated 20% risk of acquisition and transmission even with vaccination. And so because I just have a few minutes, I'll show you um, just one of our key modeling findings for the fall. This slide shows you the cumulative total estimated campus related transmission across the entire fall quarter. And so this is um, total transmissions that would either occur through residential contacts or um, random campus interactions or classroom contacts among all the UC San Diego community. And if you look at the y-axis, you can see that those bars really are, you know, on the order of 10 to 15 infections that we expect to occur, transmissions that we expect to occur that are campus related across the entire term, so maybe one or two a week. So I think the main take home point here is that we expect very few campus related transmissions in the context of vaccination, even in the context of increased campus density, such as housing and doubles and in person instruction and increased research um, related activities. Now, the two sets of bars here show the projections for two. Uh, two different proportions of students vaccinated, 75% to 95%. You can see that as you increase the proportion of students vaccinated up to 95%, you reduce the number of transmissions across the term to below five estimated um, campus transmissions. And, and so really, again, um, as we increase vaccination uptake, we anticipate that there will be very few campus-related transmissions. And the difference in bars are the differences that we anticipate with different monitoring strategies in terms of our asymptomatic testing program, as well as our wastewater program, which is an active part of our campus monitoring. But the take home point here is that you can see that all monitoring scenarios really achieve similar impact on transmission, especially with high vaccination rates, which we anticipate in the fall. And so we really can can see that even with these plausible kind of worst case scenarios, the future in the fall is looking very optimistic in terms of a campus where we see very few um, transmissions and high numbers of vaccinated individuals. So happy to answer more questions um, in the Q&A and in the chat, and I'd like to hand it back over to Dr. Continetti. Thank you, Drs. Martin and Schooley, for this information today and your guidance and leadership over the past year in helping us navigate these incredible challenges. Next, we will hear from Terry Winbush, Senior Director for Labor Relations and Employee Relations. Terry's going to brief us on the staff return to campus regarding the timing and expectations for increasing our in person efforts on campus. Terry. Thank you, Bob. And thank you, Chancellor Coastal, for teeing up the conversation for me so nicely. Uh, so, as uh, many of you are probably wondering, you know, what are the plans for staff uh, over the next several months? And as the Chancellor noted, we are preparing for a path to September 1st for September uh, for campus campus staff. Um, during that time, HR is working very closely with all of the vice chancellors and the executive vice chancellor and their senior leaders on planning uh, that time frame and prioritizing who needs to be uh, returning and in what capacity. Sooner than September 1st, uh, there are some areas who have indicated 
the need to start having a more in-person presence uh, in June and July, um, as well as August as we lead up to September. Uh, so one of the things that we wanna make sure uh, that we are providing for staff is uh, communication, uh, you know, continue communication throughout this time. And they can expect communications from their vice chancellors and senior leaders within the next four to six weeks. And in many cases, very, uh, very much sooner than that, as soon as next week. Um, we also are making a commitment to a 30 or more days notice uh, for any change in work arrangement for personnel. So even for those folks who have been working in person, we do wanna give them notice if there will be a shift um, to their work schedule in some way. And then for those who have been hybrid and uh, remote, we want to give them notice of any shifts uh, in, in their work arrangement as well. This is all being guided by, uh, as Chancellor noted, the foundational principles, as well as the commitment to flexibility uh, with equity, safety, and innovation in mind. Next slide, please. Along the, the principles of the uh, equity, safety, and, and, and innovation, uh, we want everyone to keep in mind as we're thinking through these things. And for you all who supervise staff and work with staff, we are thinking through uh, our rich diversity on campus and making sure we integrate considerations to address barriers and disparities that have impacted our employees so that we can achieve equitable outcomes in all that we do in our workplace. Flexible work can enable a more inclusive workplace, and we are doing our level best to, uh, to become more inclusive every single day. The main thing that we want everyone to know uh, is that our campus is safe. It's been the safest place to be throughout this pandemic, and we want staff and faculty, uh, academics, and students to know that so they know that they can start returning to campus in a safe place and in a safe way. Now, we also know that other external factors may determine the capability of many employees to return to campus and in what work arrangements. There are still limitations uh, that require us to continue wearing masks right, right now. Uh, there are still certain uh, social distancing requirements. Uh, there are external things like child care and elder care limitations that prevent some uh, staff being able to return to campus because they have no, no place to, to take care of the um, loved ones with, that they have. So we're keeping these things and a lot of other factors in mind as we're doing the planning, uh, but we really do want to start ramping up to, to that vibrant campus uh, that, we, that we know and love so that uh, the educational mission can continue. Thanks. Okay, thank you, Terry. Uh, next, we are going to hear from Dr. Stephen Constable, Academic Senate Chair, and Dr. Carlos Jensen, Associate Vice Chancellor for Educational Innovation, about planning for our summer and fall teaching. Thank you, Dr. Campanetti. Um, I'll start us off uh, with some brief updates on what summer looks like. And uh, we're starting to see that vibrant campus community come back. Um, this summer will include both in-person and remote course offerings. Uh, as you can see in the graph here, uh, demand has been up greatly. Um, shot up last summer, we've seen persistent demand going on. Most of the offerings are remote offerings, but we do have a handful of uh, in-person offerings. Um, we are allowing REU and outreach programs. Um, those need to be accounted for. There needs to be an MOU so everyone knows what to expect, um, but you can contact your dean if you have a program that you wanna um, uh, launch. Summer Bridge um, was all remote last summer. Uh, this summer, we will uh, transition to a hybrid offering. Most of the students will be remote, but there will be uh, a cohort of students who will be, de be doing some of their coursework, some of their activities uh, on campus, and we're very excited about that. Um, the outcomes for that cohort last year were tremendously positive, and we want to build on that success. And then we're looking forward to um, the transition to fall and full uh, return to, to on-campus activities. And so uh, onboarding activities starting from early September uh, with 50% capacity indoor and outdoor. Uh, and that's one of the things that um, we emphasize, the outdoor uh, uh, facilities will remain to give faculty options uh, to teach. Um, demand, as I mentioned, for, for summer offerings is, is up and I wanna thank everyone for continuing to, to offer a lot of variety of courses to our students. Um, this is having a very positive impact on their 
uh, ability to, to meet degree requirements and time to graduation. Um, and as you can see here, over a quarter of our students are currently signed up for summer classes, and we have a wait list of over 3,000 students already. And this is week two of registration. So um, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Constable to talk about fall and uh, what to expect for fall. Thank you, Carlos. Um, the Senate's been working with the administration um, to create a plan for fall instruction with the expectation that we will be able to offer predominantly in-person teaching at or near full capacity. And while whatever we do in the fall will be subject to state, county and CDC guidelines, um, the current trajectory of the pandemic and the vaccine rollout, along with the models you've just heard Natasha present, um, give us confidence that in-person fall teaching will be possible and it will be safe. However, it is inevitable that there will be a residual need for remote instruction, either to accommodate circumstances of individual instructors or for students who are unable to return to campus. And as you probably know, remote instruction other than approved R courses require an exception to Senate policy. Um, such, an exception, such an exception has been granted through summer this year on the expectation that instruction is predominantly remote. But for the fall, we're hoping that only a few instructors will need to teach remotely. But the Senate is not in a position to grant exceptions on a case by case basis and, and for medical accommodations, the Senate is not the appropriate body. We did not want to grant a blanket fall exception back in March when classes were being scheduled for the fall because we did not want instructors to feel pressured to make early decisions before they knew what the situation was going to be like come September. Nor did we want to undermine the plan to schedule all four classes in person, since it is a lot easier to pivot to remote instruction than it is to find a classroom to teach in person at the last moment. So, um, oh, however, instructors were already asking for, for assurance that remote instruction would be possible if needed. So at its March meeting, the Educational Policy Committee approved a blanket exception to the remote instruction policy, which allows both graduate and undergraduate courses to be taught remotely in the fall, but made this policy effective July 1st, 2021. This allowed the administration to continue to schedule all classes in person, but gives instructors the, the assurance that should the need arise, they will be able to pivot to remote instruction closer to the fall. We are also hoping that visa and travel restrictions will have eased by the fall, um, but remote versions of large enrollment gateway classes will be offered as needed in order to accommodate students who are still stranded out of the country. The Senate and the administration recognizes that teaching a class both remotely and in person is essentially twice the work of doing either. And there will be no expectation that instructors will have to do this. On the other hand, as we recommended last fall, it is good practice to make course materials available online for asynchronous study by students who cannot show up in person. But again, this will be the decision of the individual instructor. Finally, uh, although not the purview of the Senate, I will note that the residency provision of APM 730, under which academic year personnel are expected to be in residence from the beginning of fall through the end of spring, will again be in effect starting this fall. So having explained policy, the, uh, having explained the Senate policy provisions, I will pass the vir virtual podium back to Carlos for details of implementation. Thank you, Stephen. So with that, um, this is the, the current plan for fall term. Um, we are uh, operating under the following assumptions, 100% uh, capacity, design capacity, um, with modifications and accommodations where needed. And uh, VC uh, Matthews will come on after us and talk about some of those modifications and some of those uh, accommodations. We will have both indoor and outdoor classrooms available to us. Um, and that, that, that will be uh, to the extent that there's capacity up to the instructor to choose which, uh, which option they're most comfortable with, which option is most appropriate for them to use. Masking will be required. Um, and there will be other safeguards, including sanitation, et cetera, in place. Where we are right now, uh, the preliminary schedule is done. It's, it's uh, back from the registrar to the departments for that first look and for adjustments. 
Um, and as we shared, all classes have initially been scheduled as in person. Between now and the end of June, the following things are going to happen. Uh, we're going to keep monitoring the uh, travel situation, the visa situation, and ISPO and the Educational Continuity Task Force will share information with departments about the number of students impacted and, and the ways that they're impacted. Uh, we're also going to uh, keep providing updates and information about vaccination efforts and viral activity, risk activity. Um, our colleagues in advising have been working really hard to identify core sets of classes that would be particularly helpful to uh, uh, remote students uh, if, if we have uh, significant disruptions. And that's uh, an effort to boil down the total number of courses to the, the most high impact. And so if we get into a situation where we have to uh, accommodate significant numbers of, of students being remote, uh, we have a, a small list of uh, courses for, for departments to consider. Departments should be having these conversations, the faculty with, with the department, uh, to plan out priorities uh, and accommodation needs, uh, both for students and for faculty. And in an ideal world, what we want to do is we want to try to match the needs of the faculty with the potential needs of the students so that the, the faculty who, who have a need to teach remote uh, are teaching the classes that would most impact students who need to take classes remotely. And all this leading up to a July 1 uh, deadline where faculty or through their department can request adjustment of uh, instructional method from in-person to remote. Uh, and that's what we want to do most of uh, our schedule adjustment. This will be late enough that we will have a very realistic understanding of what fall will look like, but uh, give us enough time to really see how we're, how we're doing in our efforts. Um, and uh, with that, uh, Dr. Continetti, I'll, I'll pass the baton back to you. Thank you, Drs. Kospel and Jensen for that explanation of this uh, complex process of coming back for in-person work this fall. And next, we're gonna hear from Vice Chancellor for Resource, Re Resource Management and Planning, Gary Matthews, about the ventilation and preparation of indoor spaces that will support a return to broader indoor activities. Vice Chancellor Matthews. Thank you, Dr. Continetti. It's a pleasure to be with all of you. I'm extremely happy that we're moving in this direction and returning so many of you to campus. Uh, several basic comments and then we'll go to the specific uh, sanitation and, and cleaning guidelines. Uh, we certainly continue to recommend and encourage vaccinations for everyone. Uh, wear your masks. We recognize that the CDC today made some announcements about wearing masks outdoors. Uh, we will provide some campus uh, specific directions in the next day or so. And uh, please continue to watch for the changing uh, guidelines, if you will, as we go forward. Uh, there will be a need to continue to practice good hygiene and to help us all by cleaning your individual spaces, such as offices. Next slide, please. And, and I'll explain that in a bit. Uh, working with the EOC, FM facilities management has been able to assess all of the indoor air concerns for our larger buildings. And throughout the pandemic, we have increased our air exchanges. We've upgraded filtration and most importantly, cleaning and disinfection. And while the uh, pandemic and, and the transmission of the virus appears to be primarily airborne with uh, in aerosols, we'll be continuing to disinfect high touch areas until we're sure that we are uh, as safe as possible. So out of an abundance of caution, we will continue to disinfect some of those high touch areas. We are asking that faculty in their individual's offices, uh, one, uh, sanitize their workspace, uh, there will be a limited supply provided. Simply wiping it down is, is what we're talking about. And there will be supplies provided to each department on a one-time basis from the EOC. Throughout the last several months, we've installed touchless entry systems at 80% of our buildings, particularly the larger ones, uh, touchless restroom faucets, light sensors throughout the campus, uh, sanitation kits for returning labs and classrooms have been distributed as they've opened. And uh, we have performed 
uh, COVID related level three and four disinfections throughout the campus. Those will continue as well as the upgrade of the air filtration systems that I mentioned. Uh, one thing that, that I will say, I had the, the opportunity to tour the campus today and it looks a whole lot different because of, of many of the construction projects. So Gilman Drive, Boyd, Boyd Drive, Campus Point Drive are completely redone. We were able to move some projects ahead and you will be feeling and seeing uh, a new environment on the campus in many locations, as well as some, some ongoing construction. So I, I, I'm glad to start us moving in the right direction to return and we're happy to have you return to the campus. Thank you. Thank you, Vice Chancellor Matthews. Finally today, we're gonna, going to hear from Vice Chancellor for Student Affairs, Allison Satterland, about the recent campus notice about in-person events and a pilot program for in-person student team projects. Vice Chancellor Satterland. Thank you so much, Dr. Continetti. As more individuals 16 and older become fully vaccinated, fortunately, the science and data that campus monitors each day support new opportunities for in-person and on-campus events and activities for our students, faculty, and staff. Uh, Chancellor Kosla highlighted some of these in his um, opening uh, remarks, and that if this includes graduation ceremonies and celebrations, you know, uh, rich traditions that are so important to our students and their families and, and all of us um, who work in higher education and education, and dance practices, which have been on our students' hearts and minds for a very long time. This is the most uh, popular request we get from students and we're so happy to make dance practices available outdoors and uh, packaging and distribution events that make your hybrid and remote events uh, more engaging and speaker engagements as well. Um, as we continue to work to limit the spread of COVID-19, uh, we have also designed um, a campus events and activities portal and an event intake form uh, to support the development of these events. And I wanted to remind everyone, of course, that uh, events uh, must continue to be held outdoors and with limited capacities based on our county and campus guidelines. Um, and, and also to please keep in mind that any of the events that are planned um, um, do not exceed the limited capacity that the outdoor venues uh, currently are expected to abide by. And of course, as you heard from um, others on this webinar, I would like to remind everyone that face masks are required when you're on campus and um, participating in an outdoor event and of course are indoors for um, other reasons. And I, I wanted to share that we continue to review new guidance from uh, the CDC and the state, uh, the county um, and the city as it relates to food and drink at outdoor events. And we'll likely have an update soon, but uh, currently uh, no um, events may have food and beverages except uh, for hydration purposes. Um, I also wanted to share um, that as student engagement um, slowly begins to resume, our threes company program in which the three students could socialize outdoors, masked while physically distanced has been expanded from three students per group to 10 students per group. Um, of course, this remains um, uh, to be outdoors and masked and physically distanced and includes outdoor study groups, um, uh, gatherings of, of students um, for social visits together hopefully participating in some of our great recreation and health and well-being activities. And we have a number of uh, resources that are available online uh, for our students um, at our um, virtual student union, as well as on the student affairs uh, website. I also wanted to highlight that uh, we learned quite a bit from our Stay Safer Spring Break Initiative. Um, and with uh, the new campus events and activities portal and our event intake form, which is a collaboration across many units on campus, We've been able to launch a pilot program with the Jacobs School of Engineering for up to eight uh, JSOE student clubs and organization teams to work closely with student life, their faculty advisor, um, and the dean's office, particularly uh, Dr. Alvarado, to develop a, a, a safer outdoor team building a proposal for projects. And we'll take what we learn from this pilot over the next uh, few weeks to adapt safety and planning protocols for uh, summer and fall student um, activities. I'd also like to thank the 45 plus faculty who supported our Safer Spring Break initiative by hosting undergraduate students for, for research and engagement. And I look forward to seeing more of our students uh, working with you all um, in the coming months and weeks as to campus. 
So thank you for the time, uh, Dr. Continetti. I'll turn it back over to you. Thank you, Vice Chancellor Satterland. Now it is time to move on to the question and answer segment of this town hall. I invite all of our panelists, including Dean of the Graduate Division, Jim Antony, Executive Director of the Housing and Dining and Hospitality, Hemlata Javeri, Vice Chancellor for Research, Sandy Brown, and Jeff Cook, Chair of the Educational Policy Committee of the Academic Senate to turn on their videos, as well as our panelists. So the format is gonna be that we followed before during registration, attendees had an opportunity to submit questions for the panelists to answer. We've selected some of the most popular questions for the panel today, but uh, there's been a, a lot of questions added in the Q&A window today as well. So please continue to use the Q&A window to, to submit additional questions during the session and we'll do our best to provide answers. Due to time limitations, we may not be able to get to all of your uh, questions. However, we will do our best to post the answers in the FAQ at returntolearn.ucsd.edu. Uh, a link that will be posted in the chat. So the first question goes to uh, Carlos Jensen. Uh, AVC Jensen, as we transition back to in-person teaching, what resources will be available to support students with specific needs? For example, students with disabilities or requiring medical accommodations, students who can't travel due to visas, visa issues, et cetera. A broad so, question. Yeah, thank you for that, that question. Um, there, there are really two different populations in, in that group. Um, students with disabilities or medical conditions need to be supported through disability access uh, services. Uh, DAS, as it did before the pandemic, will work with instructors, advisors, and the departments to find appropriate accommodations for students uh, who meet those eligibility criteria. And um, it's, it's on all on us, it's on all of us to, to find ways that we can support those students and, and their, their educational journey. Um, for students who are unable to return to campus because of travel restrictions, um, our goal is to work with the departments and for the faculty to work with their department to identify ways that we can minimize that impact. Um, as as uh, Dr. Constable shared earlier, uh, asking a faculty member to teach uh, to both a, a, an in-person and a remote audience is a big ask. That's not uh, always going to be possible. Um, but in some cases, it may be possible for part of the class to offer uh, a remote uh, participation or to split a class into two sections. What we want to do is we want to limit the number of classes where we do need to do that accommodation by routing the students into uh, a smaller set of classes. Thank you, Carlos. The next question is for EVC Simmons. Will masks be required in classrooms during fall quarter? Uh, yes, according to what we know about guidance from the CDC and other health authorities, everybody in a classroom will be expected to wear a mask uh, in, in indoor classrooms in the fall. Um, so that's why we're looking into um, what the possibilities might be for the small number of classes where wearing a mask prevents you from participating in the class appropriately, such as uh, language classes or certain music classes. We may be trying to conduct those outdoors or remotely to, because masking wouldn't be possible. Um, so uh, the, the general answer is simply yes. Thank you. The next question is for Vice Chancellor Satterland. We, we heard about uh, the prospect of having business meetings in person uh, currently, but can we have in-person meetings or events for students? How many attendees and what are the specific requirements? I know this is not the um, answer that everybody was hoping to hear, but it, it, it depends. Um, at this point, um, I, we are not approving um, in-person student club and organization meetings. Um, we are, however, able to support uh, student events um, such as a, a speakers uh, series doors or um, students together around um, an outdoor uh, movie. Uh, there are a number of things certainly can do at this particular time. And you know, I would encourage um, students and faculty advisors uh, to reach out uh, to vcsa at ucsd.edu. And depending on what they're interested in, I can get them connected to uh, the right colleagues um, who have expertise in the particular events that they're interested in supporting, dependent on what the expectations and safety requirements are for the venue. Thank you. 
The next question is for EBC Simmons. Uh, will instructors be allowed to choose whether to teach in person or remotely during the fall quarter? So in answering this, I'll build on what the Senate chair said when he gave a very clear um, description of the process that we're going to be following. So basically, in uh, starting July 1st, if an instructor um, uh, uh, believes that they need to teach uh, remotely, then they would work with their department to determine whether the course that they're planning to teach is one that could be taught remotely or should be taught remotely for the educational purposes of the department or program. And if so, then they can just work with the department to, uh, to arrange that if, uh, if that works for the department. Uh, I could imagine there could be a case where the person is scheduled to teach something that can't really be taught remotely uh, uh, in, um, if, say, uh, to, the, to the same degree, such as a lab course, in, in which case the department might work with them to shift what they're teaching if they needed to teach remotely, but the course they were scheduled for and needed to be in person. So basically, they'll work with their department so that we can make things work for everybody. So while we're saying that we will be teaching, we will have our courses predominantly in person in the fall, we recognize that there will need to be some flexibility for some individual circumstances and the departments will help make, make that work out well. The next question goes to ABC Jensen. What are the expectations for fall instruction with regard to large lecture classes, small discussion classes, office hours, and other in-person meetings? What kinds of safety precautions will be in place? So um, I'll invite uh, VC Matthews to, to join me in answering the, the second part of, of that. Um, as we return to predominantly in-person fall, um, we're going to be making adjustments. We're going to be rethinking how we use space. Um, and just because we have a 300 or, or larger person uh, a lecture hall doesn't mean that we have to teach 300 or plus person lectures. Um, this, these are adjustments and decisions that, that we have, uh, the programs have brought uh, discretion over uh, rethinking what is the best way to deliver the course content, the educational content that they have. Now, of course, there are physical limitations. There are only so many uh, classrooms that we can use. There's limited space on campus, but uh, this is an opportunity for us to, to think differently and to question why are we doing things the way that, that we're doing them. Um, broadly speaking, though, and I'll, I'll turn it over to, to VC Matthews, our spaces on campus will be very safe and, and we will do everything we can to, to continue to make them safe. Uh, Gary, do you have anything to add? Uh, yes, thank you. Um, as I said earlier, the, the safety focused on cleaning and sanitation will continue at the levels that we've had throughout the pandemic. Uh, daily cleaning and disinfecting of classrooms. Uh, some of what we are gonna ask that's slightly different that uh, Dr. Jensen alluded to is that we are gonna ask for a little bit of self-help. So we've asked our students to, to clean and wipe down, sanitize their individual areas, their desks, their seats, uh, upon arrival and departure, we will be providing supplies for that. I mentioned earlier that we will be asking faculty to do the same in their individual offices. So I, I think it, it will be a little more self-help, but at the same time, our commitment is to provide you the very best and the cleanest environment that we can. Um, in the chat, there's a question about elevators and it's a really good one uh, because the, the comment is the elevators are consistently packed during the day, as well as the stairwells. Um, we don't have a magic solution to that other than to ask folks to, uh, particularly after their first time in class, to assess their, if they have a need to use the lift, please do so, but plan accordingly. Uh, also, I think for some of us, I mean, I, I have a day when I can't use the stairs and there are other days that I should, and I know my physician says I should. So all of us need to look at our capabilities on any given day and, and hopefully decide to, to, to help out by reducing the traffic, particularly as it relates to the elevators. If, if I were to project going forward, uh, we will see an increase in the numbers of people being allowed in the elevator, but will not be at total capacity as in the past. So, so I think 
we're learning as we go. We've got some great milestones in particular, uh, what's already been mentioned by uh, Dr. Martin and Chip Schooley. Uh, the campus is one of the safest places to be. It's been consistently shown that, and we will continue to do our best to make sure that that, that is our reality. So we'll, we'll all have to work at it together. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Uh, the next question is uh, also from the live question and answer for EBC Simmons. Will seminars taught by guest speakers be allowed in person in the fall quarter? If so, what would they need to provide to show that they are COVID free, if anything? Um, so we do anticipate that seminars taught by guest speakers will be allowed again in the fall. Um, we are still working on details of what uh, anybody might need to provide to show that they are uh, um, able to come in to, uh, able to come into the university or to a classroom from the outside. So please stay tuned for updates on that. Um, we, it's, some, it's something that we're still working on. Thank you. Uh, the next question is for HDH Executive Director Javeri. Will there be a housing guarantee for scholarship recipients this fall? Uh, yes, we have many scholarships on campus that either guarantee housing on campus or it's a condition of their scholarship in order to receive the scholarship that they live on campus. Both of those groups will receive the highest priority to live on campus. So yes. Thank you. Uh, next question goes to Vice Chancellor for Research, Sandy Brown. And that is, uh, when do you expect that we will be able to expand on-site activity beyond the current cap of 50% in the research endeavors. Thank you, uh, Dr. Continetti. Um, we're uh, pleased that we were able to just recently increase to 50% and add uh, meetings for research purposes of up to 10 people. As long as folks maintain six feet of distance and, and are wearing masks. So that both of those changes were made recently. And normally we want to wait for a long enough period of time to see if it had any additional risk on campus because we've been so successful with no cases of transmission in research settings thus far. So as soon as uh, the county would allow us the permission uh, to increase even further, we're anticipating with, within the month if the county rates remain relatively stable that we may be able to increase uh, these numbers even further. Uh, and I will say uh, that this is a great experiment because about half of the people who are on campus for research purposes are graduate students or undergraduate students. And so it creates a good opportunity to look at what that engagement would be like as we fully open uh, in the fall. Thank you. Thank you. The next question is for ABC Jensen. Will instructors be required to offer a remote option in their courses in the fall? If so, what resources will be available for instructors to facilitate this requirement? So there will be no requirement for individual faculty to offer anything remote. We encourage uh, where possible folks to, to continue to provide the kind of sharing and the, the remote uh, options that they've provided. But we understand that in many cases that constitutes a significant additional burden. Um, we will continue to provide the same kind of support and capabilities that we have throughout this whole pandemic. That includes uh, support from educational technology services, from the digital learning hub, teaching and learning commons, et cetera. Um, now, from a, a program perspective, there may be a need to or an ask to coordinate to support remote students, but that is a resource allocation question that should be handled within the, the department. Thank you. Uh, the next question is for Senior Director Winbush. What mechanism will be in place for verification of vaccination, especially for those done out of the state or out of the country? Great question. And I know this is a top of mind thing for everyone. Uh, the short answer, and I'll just, uh, uh, follow uh, VC Satterland's response, uh, we don't know yet. <laughs> so uh, ultimately, once we have the final policy from uh, the Office of the President, we will share that out. And then once we know what the implementation plan is, we will make sure that everyone is advised on what their responsibilities or requirements might be. 
But at this point, we don't know yet, and we will keep you posted. Thank you. And then I'd like to turn turn to Dr. Schooley. And we've heard that the CSU and the University of California are going to require vaccines for in-person uh, activities, but uh, that requires vaccines moving beyond emergency youth use authorization, by my understanding. What is the prospect for that? The way things are looking, I think it's very likely at least the Pfizer vaccine will be beyond that uh, in uh, by June or early July. The Moderna vaccine probably not too long thereafter. Hard to know what's going to happen uh, with the uh, J&J &J vaccine. Uh, I'm not a legal scholar, but I did hear one of the uh, Hastings uh, School of Law professors uh, on a discussion about this EUA issue. Uh, it is true you can't require someone to to under to uh, uh, take an EUA medication or vaccine, uh, but you can require someone to be vaccinated to be part of an of a, a community setting like this. Uh, and if they choose not to, uh, then uh, we can make accommodations for that. So it, it's not uh, strictly true that the university can't require vaccination to be on campus, uh, regardless of what the status of these vaccines would be. I do imagine, though, that we'll be beyond that uh, by fall and the question will be moot. Thank you. Of course, there's a lot of questions about the vaccine, so I'm going to go on with another one to you, uh, Chip. Why was the decision made to eliminate required weekly mandatory testing for those working and attending classes on campus once vaccinated when there is a chance of becoming infected after vaccination? We've looked at the data from the health system and actually published a letter in the New England Journal of Medicine about it. Uh, and the uh, number of people that uh, actually do become infected uh, is extremely low. The amount of virus that they shed is also very low. So their likelihood of being able to transmit the virus is extremely low. And so you have to kind of balance the risk and benefits uh, and uh, costs of doing this as opposed to using the money for other things. We don't think it would substantially change uh, risk on campus. Uh, that's why we've done this uh, on campus. That's why the hospital's done this. And that's why we're seeing this kind of become the, um, the recommendation uh, broadly. I've been one of the more uh, vocal proponents of asymptomatic testing, as many people know, and I feel quite comfortable with um, dropping this requirement for people who are uh, vaccinated, unless they have symptoms, and then they should be tested. Uh, thank you. And another uh, epidemiology-related question for either yourself or Dr. Martin, uh, do we expect that 75% of students will be vaccinated and similar rates for staff in the fall? Well, I think as Dr. Schooley mentioned, um, certainly a, a, a mandate that the that uh, vaccination is required for participation of campus activities will um, improve the vaccination coverage. We're going to try to make it as easy as possible for for students uh, to become vaccinated, and if they are not vaccinated when they arrive, to become vaccinated on arrival. So, for the modeling scenarios that I showed earlier, um, it's true that those assumed as a conservative um, kind of worst case scenario that 75% of the students may arrive uh, vaccinated at the start of term, but uh, provided we can try to make it easy for the students to obtain vaccination either before they come or immediately on arrival, then we, I'm optimistic that it'll be much higher than that. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Martin, I'd like to uh, direct another question to you. Does your modeling include the possible growth of vaccine-resistant variants? Yeah, so we have done modeling at the county level, which has examined the potential impact of the spread of variants like the B117 variant first identified in the UK. And people may have seen that, um, you know, earlier this year, we were very concerned about the potential expansion of that variant to, uh, to cause a surge in infections here in San Diego County. Luckily, what has happened is actually the transmission rates at San Diego County have been the lowest they have ever been. In, in the whole course of this um, pandemic, even lower than during the March stay at home orders last year. So this uh, ability of the community to uh, maintain really good adherence to masking social distancing has reduced transmission to such low levels that even though that variant did become the dominant variant is over half of the circulating strains right now, um, we were able to manage that without having the surge like as um, we're observing in other places like in Michigan um, with the expansion of that 
variants. So, so really it's down to this unprecedented, great low transmission period we've been in that's put us in a really good position to manage the expansion of this particular variant. Um, and I think we, um, thinking forward into the future about other you know, potential variants that may pop up, I would just speak to our the really robust system we've um, that's been developed here at UC San Diego by Rob Knight and Louise Lawrence team to sequence both individual um, cases on campus so we can identify variants and uh, monitor their expansion and transmission. But they're also sequencing the wastewater. So we have two ways of monitoring so we can react accordingly if we see anything concerning arising. Thank you. And uh, well, I'd like to uh, thank, uh, thank everybody today for all the questions, but I'm afraid this is uh, all the time we have uh, for today. We, we've uh, had a vigorous question and answer period though. And again, I thank, uh, thank all the participants uh, in that regard. We're gonna work to answer everyone's questions by updating the FAQ on the Return to Learn website. And we'll also be posting a recording of this town hall as well. Uh, and I'd like to thank again, the presenters and guests today for sharing their time and information. Uh, and I thank you, the faculty of UC San Diego for attending the day, working together as a community to help bring us through these unprecedented times. I also encourage you to complete the post event survey that will be sent shortly to help us continue to improve our means of communication during this stressful period. The next town halls are in the process of being confirmed for May and they will be posted on the RTL website so this concludes today's Return to Learn Faculty Town Hall. Thank you, take care, stay safe, and I look forward to seeing you on campus again in person soon.